Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Hittinger. I am the director of the St. John Paul II Institute. Our mission is to promote the thought of John Paul II in the context of Polish history and culture. Polish saints are an important part of this mission. I will present a luminary lecture at the UST Max on December 16th to speak in more detail about Maximilian Kolbe. But let's take this opportunity to share with you a few images from my travels to Poland with students and thoughts from John Paul II, an art by a man who knew Kolbe in the camp named Marian Kolodzaja to mark this day and to lead us to a deeper appreciation of the life and work of St. Maximilian Kolbe. In June 1979, John Paul II visited three places on one day. He went to his hometown of Wadowice, the pilgrim site Kalvaria Zebzidowska, and to Oswinchem, the Silesian town the Germans called Auschwitz. After passing through the notorious gate that said, work will make you free, he, of course, would say, it's the truth that makes us free. He walks with survivors and dignitaries and regular people through the paths of the old former Polish military camp to the greatest hell on earth. He proceeds to the wall of death, the wall of death in the center of barracks 11, the site of a fake judicial sentences that led to shooting of thousands of prisoners in front of the wall of bricks and concrete. I have come to pray with all of you who have come here today and with the whole of Poland and the whole of Europe. Christ wishes that I, who have become the successor of Peter, should give witness before the world to what constitutes the greatness and the misery of contemporary man to what is his defeat and his victory, I have come and I kneel on this Golgotha of the modern world. He then says the victory through faith and love was won by him in this place which was built for the negation of faith, faith in God and faith in man, and to trample radically not only on love but on all signs of human dignity, of humanity. But Colby, he said, acted like Christ in the love of God and man and won a spiritual victory like Christ himself. And he cited 1 John 5.4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Faith in Christ is faith in the presence of love in the world. Then he visited the starvation cell where Colby and the other men spent many days in cruel deprivation, but always blessing and singing and praising God. And then he placed an Easter candle as a sign of hope in the cross and resurrection. Now I would like to share with you a few images from our student visits. It's always a very moving experience for these students. They weep, they are speechless as they try to comprehend the monstrous evil and ideology that could have set up such misery and death for so many innocent people. After walking through that gate, promising freedom through work, we learn about the many military barracks set up where there are exhibits showing all the tortures and deprivations done. Then we go to barracks number 14. We know that he often got up in the middle of the night to console weeping and suffering inmates. But this is the spot right here when punishment for someone escaping landed on a young father and husband, take me. I am a Catholic priest. This is a consistent act from his whole life as a Catholic priest and son of St. Francis. 
and a servant of Mary. There is a plaque on the wall of Barracks 14 in Polish having the number 16670. A translation is provided over top the plaque. We then make our way up to Barracks 11, the Wall of Death, visit his cell, and as we depart, we see the first clumsy attempts of the Germans to do mass extermination, first practiced on Polish priests and patriots, and then as they attempted the mass extermination of the Jews, they realized they needed to have a greater scientific design. You see here there's a gas chamber out of a storage area. They had but two furnaces to cremate the bodies. Koba was probably cremated here. We then make our way over to that scientifically designed death camp called Birkenau or Auschwitz II. There was even a train track built to deliver the victims right to an examining team of doctors and SS officers to sift through the victims as so, ma so many objects to be weighed, counted, used, and disposed of, judged on their utility or lack thereof. This is literally a line, an end of the line for the modern ideologies that deny the dignity of the person and seek to use others and just to maximize their gain. There will be five gas chambers in the form of showers, big crematoria, which the Germans tried to destroy. You can see the collapsed remains of one. The pool with the remains of the ashes of countless men, women, and children who were sacrificed to the ideology of hate and denial of the dignity of the person. And it's Kolba's victory through faith that we commemorate today. In the remaining set of images, I want to show you work by a former inmate of Auschwitz who was there from the very beginning until the end a Polish citizen, number 432. I could say these images show when 432 met 16670. He got to know Kolba very well. Kolba saved his life more than once. He designed these drawings and paintings that he did 50 years after the experience when he was sick and had a stroke, he realized that he must give testimony to what he saw about both the wickedness and cruelty, but also about the humanity and even heroic virtues and sanctity of Maximilian Kolbe. His name is Marion Kowodzie. And he is an artist and an esteemed set designer in Poland. For those 50 silent years, he just didn't know what to do with these experiences. But a Polish poet, Herbert, said, You are not saved to live. You have little time and you must give testimony. And so he did this special exhibit which is called Negatives of Memory, Labyrinths. And it's under the care of the Franciscans at the St. Maximilian Retreat Center, just two miles from Auschwitz. There's a copy of the ledger where you could see his name inscribed on number 432. These thousands of drawings and paintings are just an explosion of memory of the thousands and thousands of people he encountered and lived with and wept with and worked with, as well as 
an exploration of his own life. There are many pictures of a double man showing his younger self and his older self. He even said that this work is a kind of letter from his older self to his younger self. Take in these images of camp life. You can see our students going through the exhibit with the Franciscan priest Piot, Father Piot. It's a somber, sad encounter, but I would agree with Father Professor Tischner. He's been many times to Auschwitz and walked through Birkenau, but I have never seen what I have seen in this exhibit. My honest reaction is this, the true Auschwitz is here. This says everything. I cannot say any more than that the true Auschwitz is here. Because you see, we encounter the living memory, the encounter with people. And at a certain point, we see these eyes of all the people but people starting to disappear because that's what the camp is designed to do, to make the person disappear. Kolba emerges in these paintings as the man who never disappeared. He's the man who always was present, who suffered, but helped others in suffering, who drew on his strength as a Polish patriot and as a Franciscan priest, and with the memory of his mother, <clears throat> to give comfort and counsel to those around him. He saved numerous people from suicide, from throwing themselves against the electric wires, including the artist himself, Mary. So when he stood forth to give his life, he had already, he was already acting as Christ in the camp, and all the men knew it. That often led to even more violent attacks by the guards who would beat him down. But I think one of the most stunning of the pictures is these associations of Kolba with Christ, with a statue of Mary, the Immaculata, always present, always praying. And again, here's Father Piot bringing students in to reflect upon these things. But it is the picture of the starvation cell that is perhaps the centerpiece of the exhibit because you see Kolba in the middle with the men praying and being a presence. Above him is Christ, and above Christ are the countless murdered victims you see taken by Christ into his sacrifice. And through Christ, Kolba has this calm presence that bolstered the faith of those who died with him. So he was a modern St. Francis. And Francis, of course, is another Christ. And I think this is one of the best ways to understand the contribution of Kolba. Father Piot asked, a student to read this letter before we leave. But before you return to your everyday life, listen again to what I number 432 have been telling you. I would like to thank you for experiencing Auschwitz together with me, your presence here, your reception of my photographic plates of memory going through my labyrinth in a homage to my colleagues who were turned to ashes but they have stayed with me forever. My sketches, which you see, have been tattooed on my skin like number 432. 
They are my deep wounds, cave paintings cut in the rock for future generations, a testimony of degeneration, but also attempts to save one's humanity in the 20th century. Today is in the past. I am scribbling the question on the wall of my death cell. Please help me to answer it myself. What you have agreed to see happened not only in Auschwitz. In other words, Marion says this ideology, it's not like the same as Nazism, but the seeds are there, this denial of humanity, the utilitarian values that push away the human person, the Polish experience of the Nazis and communists has much to teach us. And that's why the Polish saints such as Maximilian Kolbe are so important to the mission of the St. John Paul II Institute. Thanks for listening and watching my video today. I hope to see you in person and online in December.